If you open your Bibles to Malachi chapter 3 again this evening, I'm glad you're here. It's good to be in God's house. And uh, we're not going to do the teenagers' testimonies tonight. I don't know what we're doing. We're maybe waiting until next week or something. There's so many that are not with us because of spring break. And of course, you probably noticed this morning, attendance was kind of down with, with spring break and stuff. Um, but Lord willing, next week we'll have kind of our whole church family back and uh, maybe we'll have a special time next week. If you'll stand with me this evening, we're reading just, I think we'll just read the first verse of Malachi chapter 3. The word Malachi means my messenger or my angel. The word angel means messenger. So sometimes in the word of God, when we're talking about angels, we're not talking about those beings created to worship God that we think of as angels. Sometimes we're talking about pastors or preachers. I mean, God is when he says the word angel, like in the book of the Revelation. Here, his name, Malachi, means my angel or my messenger. And he was sent to really wake up God's people. They had rebuilt the temple, but they weren't really on fire for God. And he was sent to wake them up. And this was the last word from God for 400 years. There's what they call the 400 silent years. And here in chapter 3, he's answering the question of chapter 2, the very last verse of chapter 2. And I'm just going to read the very last part of the very last verse, uh, Malachi 2.17, where, where they say, Where is the God of judgment? Where is the God of judgment? So you have to remember, and, and this will help us, I think, when, when we hear about that the, the Christ could come at any moment, and I heard this from the time I was old enough to pay attention in church. I had pastors when I was in the first and second grade who did not believe it would be possible for God to wait another 10 years. And here I am, all these years later. You have to understand that when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, I say we have to understand that immediately uh, the gospel was given, basically. That's called the Proto-Evangelium, or pro, proto first, you know, prototype, the first type of. The, the Proto-Evangelium means the first mention of the gospel I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise thy heel. And Adam and Eve were promised in, in a way that God understood and they began to understand. They were promised a coming Savior. And in the Old Testament, people were saved by faith also. Uh, if you don't believe that, just read Acts 10.47. But they were. They were saved by faith. Acts 10.43, excuse me. To him give all the prophets witness that whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And so they were saved by faith, looking to the Savior. So from the time of sin, God begins to promise a coming Messiah. And now we're all these years later, and now we're, about, we're in the last book of the Old Testament, and they don't know there's going to be 400 years. They don't know how many days, how many weeks, how many months. They don't know how many years it's going to be. But he's giving them the last word that Jesus, the Messiah, is coming. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Genesis 22 Lamb of Abraham and Isaac. You know, God will provide himself the Lamb. And there was the ram caught in the thicket, but that was a picture of Christ coming one day. And so here we are now. Why am I saying all this? Because many of you are like me. We've grown up in church. We've heard that Jesus could come back at any moment. We've had pastors that were passionate about it, and they ripped off all kinds of facts and figures, and, and they were all true, but he still hasn't come. But it doesn't change the fact that Jesus is coming soon. And we're supposed to live like that, that he could come back at any moment. They call that the imminent return of Christ. And so God is answering this question, where is the God of judgment? He says, behold, chapter 3, verse 1, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, that's Jesus, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord. Of hosts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that tonight you would meet with us in a powerful way. Please guide me through the scriptures that you want to, to bring forth. And Lord, just speak through me the things you want said and leave off the things you don't. And Father, we just pray that you would be honored and you would be glorified and you would teach your people from God's word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit of God who lives in every believer and he's our teacher and he's our guide and he's our comforter. And our convictor through the word of God. And we pray tonight that the Holy Spirit of God would work 
in this place to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish in our hearts and in our lives tonight. And we ask you this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to kind of go back to where we left off this morning. Talked about John the Baptist being this one that would prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. And, 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 and yet, um, and yet uh, as, as he's preparing the way and preparing the way, he's preparing the way for Jehovah God. He's preparing a way for God, capital G, little O, little D, God, God meaning God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, God, God, the God of the Bible. It's such a big deal because, folks, what if, yeah, what, just imagine this, what if you created a religion that used the same words the Bible did with different definitions for those words? And there's a few of those out there. There's a few of them out there. Where when they say the word Jesus, they are talking about a man that lived 2,000 years ago. They may even be talking about a man that lived 2,000 years ago that went to a cross. But they're not talking about the creator of the universe. They are speaking of a created being. A person who himself was created by another God. That is not the God of the Bible. No matter what you name him. And the Bible says that, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth, made of a woman, made under the law to redeem them that are under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. There was a fullness of time that that was come that God sent forth Jesus Christ to this earth. And what we're seeing here is Malachi preaching about this. And then he's preaching about uh, the John, the, the one that would prepare the way. And he's preparing the way for Jesus. And we talked about maybe many of us in our lives, we've heard preachers preach about Jesus coming. And I'm just going to pick up real quick where we left off this morning. In fact, I want you to turn with me to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, just real quick so we can all be on the same page again. Mark chapter 13 and verse 21. It says, and, and then if any man shall say to you, lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. For false Christs and false prophets shall rise and show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus is saying, listen. I'm going to reveal enough truth to you that you'll be able to know that's not me. And one of the truths that's really basic that, that if you were a young child reading through the Bible, if you, if you were, you don't have to be a scholar, you don't have to be a, a pastor, you don't have to go to Bible college, just read the Word of God with an open heart and mind. And what you'll decide is Jesus could come back at any time. But when he comes back for his children, Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He's coming back in the clouds. Now, man, every time I say something, it reminds me of something else. When he left, how'd he leave? In a cloud. And this same Jesus, which is taken up from you, shall shall come in like manner as you have seen him go. That's Acts 11, right around in there. Um, But now we're turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want you to see this. He says here in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13, we looked at it Wednesday night a little bit, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. When a believer dies, we're going to sorrow because we're going to miss them. But we're not going to sorrow as one that has no hope, because as a believer ourselves, we're going to be with them one day. We're going to see them again. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now, I'm not trying to repeat Wednesday night, and if you want more detail, go to Wednesday night and watch it on the internet, but what, what he's saying is, is to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And when a believer dies, their body stays here on earth, but they go to be with the Lord. In, in verse 14 here, it says that God is going to bring them with him in the cloud When he comes for all of his children left on planet earth. Now think about that. For God to bring them with him, they must already be with him. Okay, so all the the things you've heard are true. 
uh, uh, at least the things I've heard you've heard, and, you know, I don't know what all you've heard, but if you've heard from this passage, from this pulpit, from any preacher that's preached here, they've taught you that when a believer dies, they go right to be with the Lord. Now, this passage talks about two parts. It talks about the physical part of a person, which isn't the real you. It's just your earth suit. Your earth suit's going to quit working. One day, your earth suit, where your little ticker in there is just going to quit ticking. And the real you is going to go to be with Jesus, and they're going to do something with your earth suit. They're going to bury it or whatever they decide to do with it. They're going to do that with your earth suit. Now, you'll go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he comes back for his children, you'll already be with him. But your, your earth suit on earth, which is still here, somewhere, maybe scattered all over the place. There's people buried at sea. Maybe scattered all over the place. God's going to take that thing and give you your glorified body. Boom, just like that. And then, then it goes on in the passage to tell what's going to happen with us. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. We're not going to go before them. They're going to go before us. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Can you imagine a shout literally heard around the entire world? With the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God, I don't know what that trumpet's going to sound like, but I do know this. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. <clears throat> then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And it's going to be so awesome because you're, any, if you have any relatives in heaven, even ones you've heard stories about, you're going to know them, they're going to know you. Maybe, you. maybe you just can't wait to meet Abraham. Say, well, how will I know him? He's going to know you. Amen. He's going to walk up and know your name. And you're going to know his. You're going to know, be known even as you are known. Just like people that really, really know you know you. That's how they're going to know you in heaven. Like they really, really know you. But here's the cool thing also. You're going to know them that way too. Now, <clears throat> turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. So the Lord, first of all, is going to come back for his saints, for his children. Then he's going to come back with his saints to set up the millennial kingdom. We're not going to talk about that tonight because we're trying to stick with the passage over here in Malachi. And right now I'm kind of getting a little bit away from it. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 1. This verse is over a lot of nurseries. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just not true. Maybe they're, maybe they're all getting changed. I don't know. Uh, but the verse is true. It's talking about believers. Behold, I, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That means this. Not everyone's going to have to die. Not everyone's going to have a body that quits working. There will be believers still alive and well, just like we looked at in 1 Thessalonians when the Lord comes back. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. It's awesome stuff here. O oh, grave, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, because he paid for my sin. He fulfilled the law, and he put his righteousness on my account. And so death has no sting. And he put death to death for me. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We don't know when he's going to come back. So what can we do? Just be faithful till he does. Now, back here in the book of Malachi, he says, starts talking about this in the middle of the verse here. Uh, this Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Well, how, when did Jesus go to the temple first? We're going to look real quick at some passages where he came to the temple. Okay, first of all, let's look at John, just St. John, chapter 2, verse 16. 
This isn't when he came first. It's just one of the times. John chapter 2. In verse 16, maybe I'll back up verse 13. And the, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drave, drove them out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers of money and overthrew the tables and said unto them, that sold doves, take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten thee up. I hope I'll remember to tell you more about this in a few minutes. Turn with me to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 and verse 21 So there was purification, there was, um, when a male chi child was born, there was protocol that the women had to go through. There were seven days of purification, but then they had the boy circumcised, then there were 33 more days of purification, and then they came to the temple. When they came to the temple, they, were, they paid five shekels, they paid uh, for redemption, for the child, and then they, then they were to offer, get this, they were to offer a lamb, but a lot of people couldn't afford that. So God made provision that they could offer two doves or two pigeons. And they were supposed to be so inexpensive that anyone could do it. So, do you, so follow me here. So seven days of purification for the lady, then the boy is circumcised on the eighth day, 33 more days, total of 40 days total. And then when they come into the temple, there's five shekels. And by the way, five is the number of grace for redemption. And then there was the purification. The purification, the, the best offering would have been a lamb. But a lot of people couldn't afford that. So there was provision to offer two doves or two pigeons. And this is all in the Old Testament, and lots and lots of different passages, and it takes a long time to find it all and show you all of it, but we can do that. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 21 says, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. The word Jesus means Savior. Which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Now, this is after the 40 days. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, <clears throat> there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and, then, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And let me just say something. If you're sitting here saved, you didn't see death before you saw the Lord's Christ. And that's very important. It's eternally important that people see the Lord's Christ. The word Christ means anointed. That they see the Lord's anointed Savior, Jesus, before they see death. Or else they go to hell forever and ever. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child, Jesus, uh, to do for him after the custom of the law, then took, him, then took he him up in his arms, and blessed God, and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen my salvation. He believed that this little baby, this about 40-day-old baby, was the Messiah, was the chosen one, was the prophesied one. While most did not believe, he did which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles 
and the, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken. It's just awesome. It's just incredible. That's when he came the first time. He was just quiet, just a baby. Then he comes in. He, he, he comes again when he's, he's about 12. If you, if you, if you look there in chapter, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 49, it says, uh, you know, they go, to, they go to Jerusalem, he stays, he's asking questions that the, the smart people can't answer, and he's answering questions that the smart people are asking, because he's God the Son. And he said unto them, they, they go looking for him, they're missing him, they go a couple days journey home, they realize, hey, where's Jesus? I don't know if any of you have ever done that before, uh, or if you've ever been that kid. Some of you have been that kid. If you have a bunch of kids in your family, you'll probably be that kid one day. So when your parents say, it's time to get in the car and go home, you better go get in the car. Especially if they drove two cars to church. Better hurry up. I'm just telling you, kids, you better hurry up. Tonight when church is over, your parents say, go get in the car, you might want to go get in the car. Because one of these days, if your family has a lot of kids and you drove two cars to church, somebody's going to get left. Well, Jesus got left. And then they go back into Jerusalem, they find him, verse 49, he said unto them, how is it that you sought me, wist not that I must be about my father's business? Now, I, I don't know if, where you're at on all this, I don't know, in other words, if the way I'm saying this, that it's even possible to grasp the magnitude of it. But Malachi chapter 3 says, I mean, they say in the end of chapter 2, where is the God of judgment? And he answers, I'm sending him. I'm sending him to this earth. He's not coming first as a lion. He's coming first as a lamb, but I'm sending him. And he's going to come to this very temple, this one right here that they're, you know, that they're worshiping. It's been completed. He's going to come to that temple right there. And he's going to, his parents are poor, but they're going to come and they're going to pay those five shekels. And they're too poor to, to offer the lamb but they're going to offer those two turtle doves or those two, those two doves or those two pigeons. And I just think to myself, yes, but when my Jesus came for me, he offered himself. He offered himself the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, here's another thing I want you to consider. That prophecy was about that, our Jesus and that temple. And since that temple got destroyed in 70 A.D., Think about what I just said. Think about the millions of people around the world who are still looking for a Messiah to come when they're not really grasping it. It's right here in the Bible. This is in the Old Testament that they say they believe. And they know the Old Testament better than we do, most of them. Most of the Jewish people do. But somehow they're blinded to the fact that there's a very specific prophecy here about Jesus coming to this very temple. The Messiah, the Savior, Jesus, coming to this very temple, the, the, the one that's, that, that's designated to be the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, is coming to this very temple. And guess what? That temple was destroyed. It doesn't exist anymore. And yet they're not able to see this, and they're looking for a Messiah still. But he already came, and he's already been here, praise God. And that temple is going to get rebuilt. Now, he said something. He said, if, if you destroy this temple, I'll build it, build it again in three days. I want you to think about that. Because what he was saying is something that he couldn't grasp. And it's so much bigger. When, think about this. When we get to heaven, there's no need of the sun nor the moon to light heaven. Because the glory of God will light it. Okay? And he says... He's speaking of his own earthly body. He's saying, you can destroy this body. And you can destroy this body. And by the way, he gave up the ghost. And that's important. He owed no sin debt. And he voluntarily died for our sin. Right outside Jerusalem there. And he, he hung on a vertical altar. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And he shed his blood for the sin of all of mankind. And he 
He's prophet, priest, king, lamb. He took his own blood to the mercy seat in heaven, to the real one, and offered it there. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And that sin was all in the total satisfaction, everything that the Father was looking for, everything that he needed on your behalf, Jesus took care of there. And he offered it for you. And he offered it for me. Now where does he live? Well, turn with me to 1 Corinthians. This will tie together here in a second. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. There's a temple. There's a temple where he dwells. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Remember, he called his own body a temple. And he calls your body one too. 1 Corinthians 6. I'm going to go ahead and start in verse 18 because it's so important to the passage here. It says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Yeah, that new temple has not been built. But Jesus has a place on this earth. If you're saved, the Bible says in Ephesians 3.17 that he lives in in your heart by faith. The Bible says that in Ephesians 1.13 that the Holy Spirit of God lives in you. And Ephesians 4.30 that he was sealed in you until the day of redemption. And, And you and I now are the temple of God. He lives in us and he wants to live through us and he has the power to give you real life turn with me to John chapter 10 John chapter 10 I don't know what we think we're looking for sometimes but if you have Jesus you have everything you're really looking for you really do I know sometimes the world's so good at it so good at getting us off off focus and off track and our flesh it's always wanting the wrong things and half the time when there's a decision to be made when there's a you know something happens in our presence and and we have to do something or we react to it almost I'd say more than half the time our natural reaction is wrong it's actually going to hurt us I'm going to try to tell you something real quick and be really careful with it The other day, something happened with one of our kids. And somebody, an adult, mistreated one of them. It wasn't anybody in our church or anything like that. And um, and so I wanted them to learn how to handle that. I wanted them to go and face this person eye to eye. Because it was an adult, and of course, our girls are just, you know, they're kids. They're young ladies. I knew that would be very hard for them. But I really wanted them to see, to see it. And of course, fear. Fear came over, and I'm afraid. And um, what, what if they don't react right? What's going to happen? So... I didn't force them to do what I wanted them to do. And in the end, she chose not to. And so, I just couldn't let it go. So I went over to the house and knocked on the door. Lady comes out. I said, um, thankfully her dog was going nuts. So she had to shut the door. So it's just her and I standing on the front porch. And I said, I need to speak with you about something that happened the other day. That's all I had to say. I would be, try to be very careful. Here. And she just started, she, she just broke. You mean, what I did that, you mean what I did to your daughter on that day when I said that? I'm so sorry. I was so wrong. I was totally wrong. Your daughter did absolutely nothing, nothing wrong. It was 100% me. What can I do to make it right? I am so sorry. Did I know for sure it was going to go that way? No. 
Was it the right thing to do? Yes. Unfortunately, our daughter didn't get to see it, though. Now, she's got to see this. She's got to see that. Because the lady says, well, what can I do now? I said, I think what you can do now is I'll go home and I'll, I'll tell what happened here. And I think she'll believe me. And then when you go and hug her next time you guys are around each other, when you go up and show her some concern and you talk to her and, and you treat her right, then she'll know that what I told her is true. That's, that's all I think you need to do. She said, okay. And that's what she did. Showed her love, showed her concern, treated her really good, loved on her. I think everything's okay. So why did I say that? Because you've got the word of God. I've got the word of God. I've got the God of the word. Now listen, I do the same thing. I hesitate to do what I'm supposed to do too. I'm not saying, okay. All of us, we struggle. The, the flesh lies to us. The world lies to us. The devil lies to us. God purchased us an amazing life with his own blood. He lives inside of us. He lives in our heart by faith. He sealed the Holy Spirit of God in us. He wants us to have an abundant life. He's told us how to do it in the word of God, and yet we're afraid. Why? Well, the simplest reason, because we're human. I doubt there's anyone in here, if you'd be honest with yourself, that's not afraid to do the right thing sometimes. And I tell you that story simply because of this. Because a lot of times it turns out good doing the right thing. The devil has us believe and it won't. But a lot of times it does. I'd say this, every time in the long run it does. You think Joseph wasn't a little nervous going down to bring his brother's lunch? Yeah. You think maybe when they threw him in the pit, he's saying to himself, uh, I should have trusted my gut. I was a little nervous about this. I knew they were pretty upset at me. I thought maybe bringing them lunch would kind of smooth it over, but it didn't work, and I kind of knew it wouldn't. Oh, they're coming to get me. Oh, good. They, everything's going to be okay. Oh, you're selling me now. It didn't look like things were turning out right, right? It looked pretty bad for him. And then it looked worse for him. And then he gets sold and into Potiphar's home. And then Potiphar's wife lies on him. And it just looks worse and worse. And then he goes to jail. And they forget about him. And finally one of them remembers him. And then he gets brought before the Pharaoh and, and tells the, 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 the interpretation of the dream. And the Pharaoh knows. Somehow he knows. Because everything Joseph puts his hand to, God's blessing him. Even in jail, God blesses him to where, though he's a prisoner, he's like in charge of the other prisoners. What does this have to do with? Because God lives in our temple. And he's got a, an abundant life for us. John chapter 10 and verse 10 says this. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd that giveth his life for the sheep. He's the good shepherd and we can trust him. He lives in us right now. You're the temple. You're the temple. When you look in the Old Testament how important that temple was, you're important to God. You are where, I'm where, we are where, this, where the God of the Bible dwells on planet Earth in us. This is a big deal. And God's got a great work that he wants to do in and through every single one of us. He wants to give us an abundant life. Is every day going to be wonderful? No. Are we going to have opportunities and fail? Yes. But more, the more that we trust him, and the more that we walk with him, the more you'll see God knows what he's talking about. And you can trust it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just ask in Jesus' name tonight that, Lord, you just take the word of God and use it in our hearts today. Father, I pray for our whole church. All of us are facing different things all the time. God, I pray that... That as we consider the fact that we are the temple of God, you live in us if we're born again. We can have an abundant life in Christ. It is fearful. I would be lying if I said I always did the right thing, because I don't. And a lot of times I don't because of fear, God, and you know that. I pray, Father, that you just take the word of God today and show us that we can trust you, 
Father, if there's even one soul here tonight that's not saved, that they can first of all trust you with their own salvation. And then every believer, we can trust you with every one of life's situations. And God, when you show us clearly in the Bible the right thing to do, I just pray that you give us that strength to go ahead, your strength to go through with it and trust you, through, trust you with it, Lord. That you could show us a time and time again, once again, we can trust you. Father, we pray that you bless this time of invitation. We ask that our response to your word would bring you honor and glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.